name is Caroline. I'm from Lake Mary High School, and today we're going to be reading part of The Big Friendly Giant. All right, okay. The Witching Hour. Sophie couldn't sleep. A brilliant moonbeam was slanting through a gap in the curtains. It was shining right on her pillow. The other children in the dormitory had been asleep for hours. Sophie closed her eyes and lay quite still. She tried very hard to doze off. It was no good. The moonbeam was like a silver blade slicing through the room onto her face. The house was absolutely silent. No voices came up from downstairs. There were no footsteps on the floor above either. The window behind the curtain was wide open, but nobody was, was walking on the pavement outside. No cars went by on the street. Not the tiniest sound could be heard anywhere. Sophie had never known such a silence. Perhaps she told herself this was what they called the witching hour. The witching hour somebody had once whispered to her was a special moment in the middle of the night when every child and every grown up was in a deep, deep sleep and all the dark things came out from hiding and had the world to themselves. The moonbeam was brighter than ever on Sophie's pillow. She decided to get out of the bed and close the gap in the curtains. You got punished if you were caught out of bed after lights out. Even if you said you had to go to the lavatory, that was not accepted as an excuse and they punished you just the same. But there was no one about now. Sophie was sure of that. She reached out for her glasses that lay on the chair beside her bed. They had steel rims and very thick lenses. She could hardly see a thing without them. She put them on, then she slipped out of bed and tiptoed over to the window. When she reached the curtains, Sophie hesitated. She longed to duck underneath them and leaned out of the window to see what the world looked like now that the witching hour was at hand. She listened again. Everywhere it was deathly still. The longing to look out became so strong she couldn't resist it. Quickly, she ducked under the curtains and leaned out of the window. In the silvery moonlight, the village street she knew so well seemed completely different. The houses looked bent and crooked like houses in a fairy tale. Everything was pale and ghostly and milky white. Across the road, she could see Mrs. Rance's shop where, where you bought buttons and wool and bits of elastic. It didn't look real. There was something dim and misty about that too. Sophie allowed her eye to travel further and further down the street. Suddenly she froze. There was something coming up the street on the opposite side. It was something black, something tall and black, something very tall and very black and very thin. It wasn't a human, it couldn't be. It was four times as tall as the tallest human. And it was so tall, its head was higher than the upstairs window of the houses. Sophie opened her mouth to scream, but no sound came out. Her throat, like her whole body, was frozen with fright. This was the witching hour, all right. The tall black figure was coming her way. It was keeping very close to the houses across the street, hiding in the shadowy places where there was no moonlight. On and on it came, nearer and nearer, but it was moving in spurts. It would not, it would stop, then it would move on, then it would stop again. But what on earth was it doing? Aha, Sophie could see it now, what it was up to. It was stopping in front of each house. It would stop and peer into the upstairs window of each house in the street. It actually had to bend down to peer into the upstairs windows. That's how tall it was. It would stop and peer in, then it would slide onto the next house and stop again and peer in, and so on all along the street. It was much closer now, and Sophie could see it more clearly. Looking at it carefully, she decided it had to be some kind of person. Obviously, it was not a human, but it was definitely a person. A giant person, perhaps? Sophie stared hard across the misty, moonlit street. The giant, if that was what he was, was wearing a long black cloak. In one hand, he was holding what looked like a very long, thin trumpet. In the other hand, he held a large suitcase. The giant had stopped now right in front of Mr. and Mrs. Gucci's house. The Gucci's had a green grocer's shop in the middle of the high street, and the family lived above the shop. The two Gucci children slept in the upstairs front room. Sophie knew that. The giant was peering through the window into the room where Michael and Jane Gucci were sleeping. From across the street, Sophie watched and held her breath. She saw the giant step back a pace and put the suitcase down on the pavement. He bent over and opened the suitcase. He took something out of it. It looked like a glass jar, one of those square ones with a screw top. He unscrewed the top of the jar and poured what was in it into the end of a long trumpet thing. Sophie watched trembling. 
She saw the giant straighten up again, and she saw him poke the trumpet, and through the open window upstairs, and through the open window in the upstairs room where the Gucci children were sleeping, she saw the giant take a deep breath, and woof, he blew through the trumpet. No noise came out, but it was obvious to Sophie that whatever had been in the jar and now had now been blown through the trumpet into the Gucci children's bedroom. What could it be? As the giant withdrew the trumpet from the window and bent down to pick up the suitcase, he happened to turn his head and glance across the street. In the moonlight, Sophie caught a glimpse of an enormous, long, pale, wrinkly face with the most enormous ears. The nose was as sharp as a knife, and above the nose there were two bright flashing light eyes, and the eyes were staring straight at Sophie. There was a fierce and devilish look about them. Sophie gave a yelp and pulled back from the window. She flew across the dormitory and jumped into her bed and hid under the blanket, and there she crouched, still as a mouse, and tingling all over. Under the blanket, Sophie waited. After a minute or so, she lifted a corner of a blanket and peeped out. For the second time that night, her blood froze to ice and she wanted to scream, but no sound came out. There at the window, with the curtains pushed aside, was an enormous long, pale, wrinkly face of the giant person, staring in. The flashing black eyes were fixed on Sophie's bed. The next moment, a huge hand with pale fingers came snaking in through the window. This was followed by an arm, an arm as thick as a tree trunk, and the arm, the hand, the fingers were reaching out across the room towards Sophie's bed. This time Sophie really did scream, but only for a second, because very quickly the huge hand clamped down over her blanket and the scream was smothered by the bedclothes. Sophie, crouching underneath the blanket, felt strong fingers grasping hold of her, and then she was lifted up from her bed blanket and all, and whisked out of the window. If you can think of anything more terrifying than that happening to you in the middle of the night, let's hear about it. The awful thing was that Sophie knew exactly what was going on, although she couldn't see happening. She knew that a monster, or giant, with an enormous long, pale, wrinkly face and dangerous eyes, had plucked her from her bed in the middle of the witching hour and was now carrying her out through the window smothered in a blanket. What actually happened next was this. When the giant had got Sophie outside, he arranged the blanket so that he could grasp all four corners of it at once in one of his huge hands, with Sophie in prison inside. In the other hand, he seized the suitcase and the long trumpet thing and off he ran. Sophie, by squirming around inside the blanket, managed to push the top of her head out through a little gap, or gap just below the giant's hand. She stared at she stared around her. She saw the village houses rushing on by on both sides. The giant was sprinting down the high street. He was running so fast his black cloak was steaming out behind him like the birds of like the wings of a bird. Each stride he took was as long as a tennis court. Out of the, the village he ran and soon they were racing across the moonlit fields. The hedges dividing the fields were no problem to the giant. He simply strode over them. A wide river appeared in his path. He crossed it in one flying stride. Sophie crouched in the blanket, peering out. She was being bumped against the giant's leg like a sack of potatoes. Over the fields and hedges and rivers they went, and after a while, a frightening thought came into Sophie's head. The giant is running fast, she told herself, because he is hungry and he wants to get home as quickly as possible and then he'll have me for breakfast. The giant ran on and on, but now a curious change took place in his way of running. He seemed suddenly to go into a higher gear. Faster and faster he went, and soon he was traveling at such a speed that the landscape became blurred. The wind stung Sophie's cheeks and made her eyes water. It whipped her head back and whistled her ears. She could no longer feel the giant's feet touching the ground. She had a weird sensation they were flying. It was impossible to tell whether they were over land or sea. This giant had some sort of magic in his legs. The wind rushing against Sophie's face became so strong that she had to duck down again into the blanket to prevent her head from being blown away. Was it really possible that they were crossing oceans? It certainly felt that way to Sophie. She crouched in the blanket and listened to the howling of the wind. It went on for what seemed like hours. Then all at once the wind stopped its howling 
The pace began to slow down. Sophie could feel the giant's feet pounding once again over the earth. She poked her head up out of the blanket to have a look. They were in a country of thick forests and rushing rivers. The giant had definitely slowed down and was now running more normally. Although normal was still a silly word to use to describe a galloping giant. He leaped over a dozen rivers. He went rattling through a great forest, then down into a valley and up over a range of hills as bare as concrete. And soon he was galloping over a desolate wasteland that was not quite of this earth. The ground was flat and pale yellow. Great lumps of blue rock were scattered around and dead trees stood everywhere like skeletons. The moon had long since disappeared and now the dawn was breaking. Sophie, still peering out from the blanket, saw suddenly ahead of her great crag craggy mountain. The mountain was dark blue and all around it, the sky was gushing and glistening with light. Bits of pale gold were flying among delicate frosty white flakes of cloud. And over to one side, the rim of the morning sun was coming up red as blood. Right beneath the mountain, the giant stopped. He was puffing mightily. His great chest was heaving in and out. He paused to catch his breath. Directly in front of them, Sophie lay against the side of the mountain. Sophie could see a massive round stone. It was as big as a house. The giant reached out and rolled the stone to one side as easily as if it had been a football. And now where the stone had been, there appeared a vast black hole. The hole was so large, the giant didn't even have to duck his head as he went in. He strode into the black hole, still carrying Sophie in one hand, the trumpet and suitcase in the other. As soon as he was inside, he stopped and turned and rolled the great stone back into place so that the entrance to his secret cave was completely hidden from the outside. Now that the entrance had been sealed up, there was not a glint of light inside the cave. All was black. Sophie felt herself being lowered to the ground. Then the giant let go of the blanket completely. His footsteps moved away. Sophie sat there in the dark, shivering with fear. He's getting ready to eat me, she told herself. He will probably eat me raw, just as I am, or perhaps he'll boil me first, or he will have me fried. He will drop me like a rasher of bacon into some gigantic frying pan sizzling with fat. A blaze of light suddenly lit up the whole place. Sophie blinked and stared. She saw an enormous cavern with a high rocky roof. The walls on either side were lined with shelves and on the shelves there stood row upon row of glass jars. There were jars everywhere. They piled up in the corners. They filled every nook and cranny of the cave. In the middle of the floor, there was a table 12 feet high and a chair to match. The giant took off his black coke, cloak and hung it against the wall. Sophie saw that under the cloak, he was wearing a sort of collarless shirt and a dirty old leather waistcoat that didn't seem to have any buttons. His trousers were faded green and were far too short in the legs. On his bare feet, he was wearing a pair of ridiculous sandals that for some reason had holes cut along each side with a large hole at the end where his toes stuck out. Sophie, crouching on the floor of the cave in her nightie, gazed back at him through thick steel-rimmed glasses. She was trembling like a leaf in the wind, and a finger of ice was running up and down the length of her spine. Ha! shouted the giant, walking forward and rubbing his hands together. What has us got here? His booming voice rolled around the walls of the cave like a burst of thunder.